We're in Matthew chapter 17. We're going to read from verse 14 to verse 20. Verse 14 to verse 20. I'm reading out of the ESV translation. If you don't have a Bible with you, you'll see it up there on the screen to follow along. If you're there, say amen. Amen. It says this, and when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. Some translations will say the devil. And it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly, at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing, someone say nothing, will be impossible for you. The time of our Bible study tonight will be titled, Why Won't It Work? Why Won't It Work? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these moments that we have the privilege of stepping into. We know that you're here, you're with us. We ask, Lord, that you would become even more active within our minds and in our hearts in these next few moments as we study through your word. Let it become alive to us. Let it not just be mere words on pages, but may we experience the life and the transformation that is in your word tonight. God, I pray for an increase of faith. Lord, that you would increase the measure of our faith tonight. Holy Spirit, you are the great persuader. And so even after the studying of tonight, Lord, I pray that you would persuade us to to believe you, to trust you, to expect even great things from you that are in accordance with your word. That's what we ask. Lord, remove any distractions that might hinder us from hearing you plainly and clearly tonight. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. If you haven't said hi to anybody, turn around and say hi you're watching online, leave a comment. Let us know you're watching um, with us tonight. Why won't it work? Why won't it work? Tonight, I want to talk to you about the effectiveness of faith. The effectiveness of faith. How many know faith is incredibly important? The Bible says without faith, you cannot please God. That's how important it is, right? Like we could stop right there. When it comes to the discussion around the topic of faith, I think that verse is all we really need. You, you can't please God outside of faith. And so tonight we want to talk about the effectiveness of faith. In this, in this story, in the scripture that we just read, there, there is a man who comes to Jesus in his desperation, that's, that's the story, that's the text we read, but uh, the context of the story is that Jesus, before this moment, takes three of his disciples up to a mountain. If you weren't with us last week, we delved deeply into that, into that story, into that text, and I encourage you to go um, listen to that Bible study in, so that, that you're up to date and you can catch all the all the jewels, all the gems that are in that story. But let me keep it short. Jesus takes three disciples up on a mountain, Peter, James, and John, and he leaves the nine, not the seven, the nine. Uh, and if, uh, if you were with us last week, you remember I couldn't, couldn't count. So I kept calling, it, calling them the seven, but really there were the nine. He, he, he asks Peter, James, and John to leave the nine and go up the mountain um, with him, and, and really the, the significance of that is that eventually you're going to have to leave 
the nine to follow the one. That the life of following Jesus is a life of being set apart. And, and you cannot follow Jesus, I think, um, correctly unless you are willing to come into grips with the reality that he will call you to be set apart. And you're going to have to decide whether you love him more than you love the thing that he's calling you to be set apart from, All right? You, you can't have two masters at the same time. You can't, you can't love two things at the same time. This is why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you because you cannot, ben- you cannot uh, benefit from the kingdom if you seek the things that will be added, Right, um, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, uh, if, you, if you aim for earth, you'll miss both heaven and earth. But if you aim for heaven, you'll get heaven and earth will get tossed in. Um, and so that's important for us to understand. Jesus will call you to be set apart. He will call you to step outside of the comfort of being the 12 and you will be set apart. He leads them up a mountain. You know the rest of the story. They encounter his glory, his transformation. They fall to their faces in fear. And the father speaks and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. We talked about the importance of glory moments. But even beyond that, a further importance is the fact that glory is short-lived. That's crucial for us to understand because a lot of times glory is romanticized to the point that people think that following Jesus is nothing but glory. And that could be nothing but further from the truth. Glory is short-lived. We do have glory moments when we come to follow Jesus, but oftentimes they are small. They are short. We're, we're, We're never called to live there. And so Jesus The three disciples, Peter, James, and John, have this glory encounter. And and of course, our favorite disciple, Peter, wants to set up camp. Remember that? He wants to to build uh, a tent, three tents, for them to stay up there because uh, there's nothing like like camping in glory. How many know when glory shows up, you just want to lay there? (laughs) And, and, And I wish, I wish that, I wish the Great Commission was, hey, just call on my glory and lay there, but it's not. The great commission is go. So you can have glory moments as long as you get up and go. Right? Uh, it's interesting. We, we, we have a lot of churches and a lot of believers chasing revival. And yet you can find no place in the New Testament where Jesus says, here's the formula for revival. I really think a lot of times we want revival. The reason we want revival is because we don't want to go. We want God to come, but we don't want to go. And so, because, because how many know it, it is, it is um, it's, it's appealing, it's romantic to talk about how God visited us. It's far less romantic to talk about how we visited our neighbor. I'm preaching already. It's, it's far less romantic to, to talk about coming down the mountain, which is what Jesus and his disciples had to do. Because you couldn't live up on the mountain. And so this story is a story where Jesus and his disciples have to come down from the mountain. They have to come down from the glory moment. They experienced God, they encountered God, they encountered his presence, but now they got to come back to reality. See, eventually you have to come down the mountain and enter the valley. Could you imagine Peter, James, and John probably still high from the adrenaline, the encounter? You know what I'm talking about when, you, when, when we have church and God shows up, you know what I mean? We're, we're still talking about it at lunch, Right? Uh, that's, that's probably a, a, a worship leader's or, 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 a, or, or a preacher's uh, uh, favorite thing. Like, hey, hey, if you're still talking about the message at lunch, I, I feel good. I feel, I feel like I did an all right job. That's when you know church was good. 
is worth talking about after the fact. And so could you imagine Peter, James, and John have encountered the glory, they've encountered the presence, and so I'm sure they, 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 they were coming down the mountain with excitement, with thrill, with, wow, we're, we're so full of the presence of this encounter, and they are quickly met with the reality of the valley. Here comes a father running to Jesus in his desperation. You ever feel like life is only good for like small moments? You know what I mean? Like, like life, life is going so good and then it's like, yeah, I knew it was too good to be true because here comes another problem. Or you ever have those moments where, where life is going so good, you're like, you're like worried now? You're like, <laughs> I haven't had a problem in a little while. Like, this next one might be real big. You know what I'm talking about? And so they come down, they come down the mountain and uh, they come to a crowd and a man comes up to Jesus kneeling before him. And he says to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son. Lord, have mercy mercy on my son for he has seizures he suffers terribly he often falls into the fire and often into the water lord have mercy on my son now this is an interesting interesting scripture interesting story i think because you know there's a lot of times where we call on we call on god we ask for god's help we need his strength we need him to intervene hello right? Um, we depend on God. That, that's part of what faith is. That's a huge part of what faith is. Faith is our dependence on God. And so, and so this, this, this man comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. It's, it's, a, it's a cry of desperation. When, when you cry out for mercy, it, it's, an, it's an indication that you've come to the end of yourself. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the first thing you do when you encounter a problem. When you, when, the first thing you do when you encounter a problem is you try to fix it on your own. You, you, you know what I mean? You know, you know if you like ever call customer service because you're having issues with a certain product and they go, well, have you tried doing this? Have you, or you have inter internet problems or, you, you know, I, I, had, uh, um, I had somebody tell me, they called the, their internet provider and said, hey, my, my internet my internet is really slow, and, 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 um, and the customer service asked him, well, is your router plugged in? It's like, yeah, it's plugged in. Like, I, I didn't say I don't have internet. I'm saying it's slow, you know? Uh, but what do they do? They give you some troubleshooting steps. Hey, 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 do all of this first. And I think we're like that naturally when it comes to life, when we encounter issues, when we encounter a problem, we, we try the troubleshooting steps and then we don't, we don't get to mercy until we've tried all of this. So what's the insight? The insight is this man is clearly desperate. Clearly he has tried everything. Clearly he's come to the end of himself and nothing has helped. That's when you ask for for mercy is when you've tried everything, nothing seems to help. Nothing seems to go your way. He, he, he even went to the disciples. That didn't work. And so, and so here comes this father asking Jesus for, for mercy. See, when you're, when you're new to following Jesus, your, your discipleship looks very different than it does when you start following Jesus and it's been a couple years. You know what I'm talking about? Because if you've been following Jesus for a little while, like, like you, you, you'll be able to relate to this text. Not everybody can relate to this text. Not everybody, not everybody knows what it means to cry out to Jesus in desperation when nothing else has worked. I don't know about you, but I've realized that at some point, formulas run out. Talk back to me if you can. Yeah. At some point, formulas run out. At some point, your strength runs out. At some point, your, your mouth gets dry from quoting all the scriptures and, and, and praying all these hours. At some point, 
your strength gives in. Hello? And those are the moments where you have no option but to turn to the mercy of God. That's when you turn to the mercy of God. Lord, have mercy on my son. So he turns to the only one who has the ability to heal and he asks for uh, mercy. He asks for mercy. I really believe that if you don't know God to be merciful, you don't know him. Hello? Hello? Hey, there's, there's a lot of people um, for, for whom um, Christianity is defined by people who lack compassion, lack mercy, they're hard-headed. Hello? That, you know what I mean? Like, like if you go out there and, tell, and, and ask the world, hey, would you describe a Christian for me? you're probably going to get negative answers. Hello? Oh, you, you mean the people who are known for everything they're against and not what they're for? Hello? He was one, yeah. And so if you don't know God to be merciful, then, then you don't know him. The first time God reveals his own character... You see, Bible readers, do you know when, when that is? It's in Exodus. That's the first time God reveals his own character. He speaks of his own character. It's in, it's in, Exodus, it's in Exodus 34. After, after he shows Moses the backside of his glory, he, he reveals his character for the first time. And, and the Bible says in, in Exodus 34, verse 6, it says, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. So the first time in the Bible God reveals his own character, God reveals that he is merciful. He's merciful. He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's the first time God reveals himself. So I really believe the more you get to know God, the more you will realize he is merciful. Why do I say that? Because the more you get to know God, the more you will realize your own insufficiencies and your own faults and failures and your own sins, and you will realize that if he was not merciful, you would not know him. How are we doing so far? We doing all right? I'm having a good time, right? Paul said it this way in Ephesians 2. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. So he, he comes to Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on me. So he calls him Lord. Uh, obviously, that is, that is the, the man approaching Jesus with honor. So, so we see that, we, we, we see that right, right away, that there, there is honor that this man has toward Jesus because he calls him Lord. There's, there's respect that he gives to him. But, but the moment he says mercy... He, he's moving even beyond the level of, of honor. The moment he says, I, I need you to, to give mercy to my son, to me, it, it's an indication that he believes Jesus has, some, he, Jesus has access to something nobody else does. It's an indication that he believes Jesus has access to, to something nobody else does, not even his disciples. It's it's. See, see, when he asks for mercy, he's, he's saying, what he's saying is this. This is what he's saying. he's saying. He's saying, I'm not asking you for something I deserve. <laughs> Your prayer life would do so much better if you stopped asking for things you think you deserve. Hello? So, so, so what he's saying is, I'm, 
Lord, I'm not asking you for something I deserve. I'm not asking you uh, 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 because I deserve it. I'm not asking you even because my son deserves it. In fact, I, I don't deserve it. That's why I'm asking for for, for mercy, I'm not even, I'm not coming to you because of how bad my circumstances are. I'm coming to you because of how good your character is. Did you catch that? See, I don't go to God because of how bad my circumstances are. I go to God because of how good I believe his character to be. The only thing that'll have me consistently following Jesus is not my circumstances, but his character. Because the day I stop believing the Lord is gracious and merciful is, is the day that I fear coming close to him. Hello? Even, even if I'm suffering the consequences of my own decisions, even if I'm suffering uh, the consequences of, of, of God disciplining me. How many know the Bible says that, that he disciplines us because we're his children? That if he didn't, then we would be illegitimate. Right? And so, and so that's incredibly, that's, that's incredibly important that even in those moments of discipline, see, see, see if, 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 God, if God wouldn't correct you, it would mean that he's not your father. Now watch this. If you don't handle his correction, it means you're not his child. See, if he doesn't correct you, he's not, he's not your father, but if you don't take his correction, you're not his child. But even in those moments, I have to believe that he's more consistent than I am. That even though my ways change and, and my feelings and my emotions are fickle, he's consistent. He's consistent, right? That's what he, 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 he can swear by his own name. Because he tried, he looked, he looked to see if there was a name greater, if there was anybody more consistent, anybody more of greater character, and he couldn't find anyone, so he swears. <laughs> and so you have to, you have to believe that. He, he, the father believed that Jesus was that, was that good. He, he, he says, Lord, have mercy on me. Now, now let's talk a little bit about persistence. Because persistence is very important to our discipleship journey. See, the problem with your faith, we're talking about faith tonight, the problem with your faith isn't necessarily the intensity of your faith. The problem with your faith is the longevity of it. That's the issue. The, the issue is, will, will you be able to preserve your faith? Right, that's why the Bible talks about even in the book of Revelation, where he says, "Hey, uh, those those who those who are still there till the end, those who endure to the end." What is what is he talking about? He's talking about the longevity of your faith. How long can you keep believing? How persistent can you continue to be? And so we see persistence in this man because because nothing has worked. He went to the disciples, that didn't work, and yet that didn't turn him away. You know what the secret to persistence is? Understanding God's mercy. That's why, that's why he comes to Jesus on the account of Jesus' mercy. See, the key to persistence is God's mercy. Mercy, Hebrews 4 says, Hebrews 4 says, uh, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. So watch this, his throne is made of grace. <laughs> Did you catch that? He, he sits on a throne made of grace. So, so let us then with confidence approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of 
need. See, persistence doesn't have to do with what you believe about yourself. It has to do with what you believe about God. Persistence isn't about what you, persistence is about what you believe about God, not what you believe about about yourself. God is a God of mercy. I believe that. See, God is not a fitness coach. God is, God is not a football coach. God is not a high school basketball coach because those coaches you can impress. And, and all you have to do for those coaches is show up, try hard. Hello? Put in the work and they'll let you play. Let me in, coach, right? I put in the work. I showed up to practice. God, God is not a fitness coach. You, you cannot come to him on the account of who you are, what you've done, what you've earned, and what you deserve. You come to him on the account of his mercy. Persistence has to do with believing something about God, not necessarily believing something about your self. See, persistence in our relationship with God doesn't come from being hard-headed. You know, you know people that are hard-headed? Nobody's being honest in church, which, which, might, mean, which might mean it's you. Right? Hard, hard-headed people. Um, because sometimes we think, sometimes we think um, people with certain personalities are gifted with persistence. All right? You, you all, either you are this person or you, I'm sure you know this person. They just, they just don't take no for an answer. Right? Right? Like, I, I know, like, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell, like, um, uh, you know, uh, these are the people that you go, oh, well, you know, they didn't, they didn't take the return. Well, did you talk to their manager? You know what I'm talking, like I'm just, I'm just not, call your manager out right, like I'm not one of those people, so you go, yeah, sorry, you've missed the 30 days, all right, my bad, you know, I messed up, I'll own it. But then there's people who are just hard-headed, they won't, they won't take no for an answer, they have personalities that just don't, they don't give up, and, and oftentimes with those individuals, the mindset is this, it's, it's I will get what I want, because I'm persistent, I get what I want. Right? Ladies, you ever encounter a man who's persistent? You're like, you're so annoying. Like, how many times do I got to say no? But what do they believe? They, they believe that uh, the quality of their persistence will win you over. I won't take no for an answer, but when it comes to our relationship with God, persistence doesn't come from believing something about ourselves. It comes from believing something about God, namely that God is merciful that when you come to his throne, you will receive mercy and find grace. Now, as hopeless as this man's situation is, there there is a little bit of hope that we see. The hope that we see is in his persistence. Even though he's tried everything, it it doesn't stop him from trying one more time. Don't you love that? It doesn't stop him from trying one more time time. And I think the reason for that is he's tried everything but this. He has tried everything but this. So let's, let's continue. He says, I brought him, my son, right? To what? Your disciples. These are people that are your representatives. These, these are your, these are your representatives. I've brought them to your disciples. Now, now, now watch this. Watch, watch what he says, right? Because the disciples are right there. It's not like the disciples aren't there. I, I brought my son to your disciples and they couldn't heal him. They, they're standing right there. They couldn't heal him. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him. Um, but now I'm coming to you. I brought him to your representatives, but they couldn't do anything about it, so now I'm coming to you. I I brought him to church, but it didn't work. 
I went to your disciples, but you were absent. I went to your disciples hoping I would find you, but you weren't there. I was looking for you, so I went to your disciples and you were absent. See, church doesn't work without his presence. Church doesn't work without his presence. So he, he, how many know, he didn't go to his disciples to look for the disciples. He went to his disciples to look for Jesus, and, and he said, he's not here, so you guys will have to do, can you do something about my son? They couldn't, so he finds Jesus. He went to the disciples, and he wasn't, he wasn't there. Um, see, see, we cannot be so married to church that, that we don't know how to sustain our own relationship with God. Right? The church is the gathering. The church isn't your relationship with God. The church is the gathering. God doesn't fill buildings, he fills people. So, so he filled you so that you could have a personal connection and relationship with him at anywhere, at any time. And so we cannot be so tied to church that our own personal relationship with God suffers. Hello? Now, what I'm not saying is, what I'm not saying is that, that our personal relationship becomes an excuse to, to miss church. Right? Because that's, that's a lot of people. A lot of people, a lot, the reason sometimes people don't come to church is not because they have something against God, they have something against people. I'm so serious. Most often when people miss church, it's not because they got an issue with God, they got an issue with people. And that's why we need church. That's why we need church. There are certain things that God has reserved There are certain things that God refuses to do in your life outside of community. Right? We we talked about it on a Sunday a couple weeks ago, but the psalmist, where the psalmist says, hey, hey, it's it's pleasant. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's the place where God commands his, his blessing. Right? So so I don't I don't come to church because I need it to survive. Right? If you, need, if you need church to survive, that's, that's, you know what I mean? You got issues. We got to talk about your relationship with God. Right? If this is the only place you think you can meet him. Let me say it this way. If, if you think this is the only place he will, he's willing to meet you. Right? Jesus, Jesus spends three and a half years doing ministry on earth and, and, and there are only a handful of encounters that he has with people in the synagogue. Most of his encounters are outside the temple. Most of his encounters with people are outside the place people expect God to be. Anyways, that wasn't part of my notes. Where, where was I? He, he, <laughs> he's... What was I talking about? He's, yes, okay. So as hopeful as, hopeful as the situation is, there's hope because, because he doesn't give up. He, he tries one more time and, and, he, and he comes to his disciples. Uh, he doesn't find Jesus there, but he, that doesn't stop him. He, he looks for Jesus. He, he is persistent. He, he is demonstrating for us what intercession looks like. He's, he's demonstrating for us what intercession looks like. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him, but I'm coming to you. Lord, have mercy on my son. He's not there for his own benefit. He's there interceding for his son. It's not that I need you. It's that my son needs you. I'm here on behalf of someone else. That's what intercession is. Intercession is showing up for the sake of somebody else. That's... that's, that's intercession, that's, 
That's what it looks like. And, and, then, and then we find out what, there's, there's not an issue with him, there's an issue with, with his son. What's the issue with the son? Well, let's go back. The Bible says this. He says, my, my son has what? Seizures and he suffers terribly. So, so how does he suffer terribly? Well, let's read on. He falls into the fire, right? So, so that's one way. And then he says, and often into the water. So that's, that's another way. In other words, what he is saying is he has seizures. He suffers terribly. He, he, he falls into fire if he's near fire. He falls into water if, he, if he's near water. He, 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 isn't just in, uh, he isn't just a victim of internal issues. He's also a victim of external issues because, because he can't control himself. He can't control where he has seizures where his body will, will uncontrollably shake and, and he'll have no control over his limbs. He'll have no control of where he can step in and where he can go and, and, and whatever his surrounding is, he becomes the victim of it because he lacks control. There's a message there, but I don't have time to go. He, he lacks self-control and so he suffers <laughs> because of his environment. So, so, so he has no control, and, and, and that causes him to suffer greatly. He falls into the fire, and he falls into, 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 into water. Now, what I, love about, what I love about this, now I'm reading into the text a little bit, but what the father doesn't explain is, is how exhausting it would be for the father. I'm, just, I'm reading into the text just a little bit, so bear with me. But, but of course, if you have a son who has uncontrollable seizures... No doubt he's going to need supervision constantly. Isn't that the beauty of the father? The father doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bring any of that up. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, it's exhausting for me to take care of my son. See, see, we have to be able to see the needs of people. Right? Beyond and past what they're going to cost us. Right, so so when Jesus says uh, when Jesus when Jesus says, "Hey, here here are the greatest commandments: love God with everything within yourself, and love your neighbor as yourself." He doesn't add except for when it's try- when it's time consuming, <laughs> except for when it gets exhausting, except for when it becomes an inconvenience to you. He says, "No, no, no, just just do it." And the implied. Language that Jesus leaves out is that it will be an inconvenience. It will cost you time and energy. And yet, the love that he mentions is agape, which is unconditional love. And so, it's a love that, that, that you cannot raise conditions towards. You cannot raise conditions against. Hey, I'm going to love unconditionally, except for... It's a love that doesn't have fine print. Hello? And so he, he's probably exhausted from taking him everywhere and, and being him with, 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 with the son at all times. And I can't even imagine how exhausting that is. And not just how exhausting it must be, but how embarrassing it must be for the father. See, this isn't a day and age where, where you go, oh man, poor, poor son, poor father, they gotta deal with this. Oh man, you know? This is, this is a day and age where, where if your son looks like what his son looks like, that's a curse. Hey, what did you do for your son to end up like that? That's the day and age they live in. So it's not just exhausting, it's incredibly embarrassing because, because he's probably blamed for how his son ended up. And he comes, to, he comes to Jesus and, and he asks Jesus for mercy. How are we doing? We're doing all right? We've we got a couple minutes and so we'll continue. Um, okay, so he, he, he says to Jesus, hey, they, they couldn't heal him. So now Jesus answers. Let's, let's talk about Jesus' response because this is where things get a little bit interesting. <laughs> right? Because Jesus doesn't respond how I would respond, by the way. You know what I mean? Like somebody comes up to me here after service and, hey, I need prayer. Oh, yeah, let me get the anointing oil. Let me call the elders. We're going to pray for you, right? Like that's, that's the protocol. That's what we, that's what we do. And, and Jesus doesn't respond like that. 
How does, how does Jesus choose to, how does Jesus choose to, to respond? He, Jesus answered saying, oh, Anybody, anytime somebody starts with an O, like, you know, it's going to be, you know what I mean? Like, oh, this is going to be bad. All right. O, faithless and twisted generation. Jesus is calling out everybody. Who's, what is, what is a generation? Every person alive at this time? Jesus is calling out everybody. O, faithless and twisted generation. Jesus, what? Like, <laughs> he's, just, he's just asking for mercy, Lord. <laughs> Faithless and twisted. One of the questions that I, that I ask is, is uh, and you can discuss it on your own, on your own time, is, is what is the correlation between belief and morality? See, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus doesn't go, hey, you're, you're an unbelieving generation. He goes, you're, you're faithless, meaning you have unbelief, but you're also twisted. You're immoral. So here's a question for you to ponder over in the next couple of days. What is the correlation be- between belief and morality? There is a correlation. What is the correlation between? Okay, let's continue. How long am I going to be with you? In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not going to be with you forever. How, how long am I going to be with you? He, so, so remember, Jesus is Absent. Is that how you spell absent? All right. I'm not a good, I'm not a good speller. All right. Jesus goes, hey, um, even in my absence, I expect faith. So, so remember, Jesus is with the three on the mountain. So, so the, disi- the, the, the disciples that the man goes to are the seven. The nine. The nine. <laughs> I was just paying it. I was just checking if you were paying attention. That's, I, that's what I was checking. Uh, <laughs> woo, all right. I'm still bad at math. All right. Okay, okay. Um, nine, nine. So, so the disciples that, that he goes to are the nine because Jesus is on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And so he goes, he goes, he goes to the nine and Jesus goes, hey, uh, how long am I going to be with you? Which is an indication that Jesus expects faith in his absence. Um, remember when Jesus, and this is, this is a scripture in Luke, but, but he, talks about, he talks about his return. And he says this, he says, when the son of man returns, will he find faith on the earth? So, so this is almost a parallel because Jesus goes up a mountain to glory comes down, expects to see faith, and doesn't. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Now, here, 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 here bears a, a pause, because we got we to gotta pause, we got to pause, we got to pause a little bit, um, because, because, um, because at first I, I read this, and I, and I thought maybe he's talking to the disciples. No, he wasn't. He, he wasn't talking to the disciples. Because he says this generation, this, this generation. So that's an indication that Jesus is speaking to everyone alive at that moment. Because later on, Jesus is going to deal with the disciples' faith in private. Because he's a good teacher. He doesn't publicly humiliate his disciples. <laughs> now, he doesn't mind publicly humiliating the generations, but... Because he's not committed to that. He, he's committed to the 12. So, so originally I thought he's talking to the disciples, which at first glance, that makes sense. You read this and you go, oh yeah, he's talking to the disciples. But, but you read and, and, you, and you start paying close attention to the wording. And why would Jesus say generation if he's just talking to the disciples? And, and here, the father is talking to Jesus and it says Jesus answered. So, so, so Jesus is talking to the man because he's giving the man an answer. Right? We're just dissecting the text. So he's not talking to the disciples. He's talking. Now here's an interesting thing about the man. Because I'm thinking, I'm scratching my head and I'm like, could Jesus be referring also to the man? Yes. Right? Because the man is desperate for his son to be healed. He's exhausted. He's not only exhausted, he's embarrassed. He came out onto the streets where his exhaustion and embarrassment are on display for everyone. 
And he came not to get nine raggedy disciples. He, he came to find Jesus. So, so then my question is, man, could it, could it be that, that, that he didn't think the nine could do anything about it? All right? Could, could, could he have thought, what are these guys going to do? I'll give it a try. It's worth trying. Right? It's worth trying. But I, I, don't know if, I, don't know, I don't know if you can do anything if he's not here. Right? No, I want the pastor to pray for me. <laughs> Woo! No, I want, I want the evangelist to pray for me. I want the prophet to pray for me. Hello? And what we don't realize is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. Hello? What if I told you that the power of God doesn't respond to titles, it responds to faith? Did you hear what I said? <laughs> How are we doing? I'm having fun. All right. So Jesus, Jesus expects faith in his absence. Now, this also indicates, this is Jesus telling everybody, hey, I'm not from here. If I'm not going to be around forever, it means I'm not, I'm not from here. Uh, how long am I going to bear with you. Now, how many know God is long suffering? So, though Jesus rebukes them for the lack of their faith, he then, he then concludes this whole thing with bring him here to me. That's what you got to love about, about God. God will correct you, God will discipline you, God will rebuke you, but make no mistake, his arms are not forever crossed. For the Bible says that when the father saw his son from a distance, he opened his arms and ran towards his son, for his son was dead, but now he's alive. See, you got to believe that even in your disobedience, God will throw a banquet for you because you chose to come home. telling you. You, you you want to come home a slave no 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 he'll he'll welcome you home a son and a daughter he'll throw he'll throw a banquet for you while you're still covered in your sin that's our God and so he says bring him here bring him here bring him here to me I'll take care of him don't worry I'll take care of him Um, bring him here to me. And then the next thing it says is, and Jesus rebuked the demon. Hold on, where where, where does the father mention the demon? Let's, Let's read the text again. Let's read the text again. They came to a crowd, a man came up to him kneeling before him saying, Lord have mercy on my son for he has seizures and suffers terribly for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. Where, where, where? I brought him to the disciples and they couldn't heal him. Where? Where is demons mentioned? <laughs> See, he, he doesn't even mention, he doesn't even mention the demon, but, but that's what Jesus rebukes. Jesus doesn't rebuke the sickness, he rebukes the demon. He, he doesn't rebuke the thing you see, he rebukes the thing you don't see that causes the thing you see. And, and, and you're still trying to deal with the symptoms. And you're not dealing with the root issue. You're dealing with the symptoms. I, I don't know why. I don't know why I can't keep a man. I 
I, I don't know. I don't know. The good ones don't. The good ones just don't come to me. Maybe it's not that the good ones don't come to you. Maybe it's so. In, maybe maybe it's the fact that you're so insecure. You don't have a good identity in Christ, so you'll just accept whatever comes knocking. Fix your identity. Then ask God for a man. Or a woman. Stay within those categories, but. <laughs> he says, he, he says, uh, he, he rebukes the demon. And, and it came, it came out of him. And, 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 and the boy, the boy was healed instantly. We're not, we're not told of the suffering. Remember we talked about this last week, glory. It comes like that. So he rebukes the demon and the boy is healed and, and it was Jesus revealing to us that it was spiritual activity that resulted in physical sickness because, because not all sickness is the same. That's why, that's why you can't treat everybody the same. Because not all sickness is the same. Which also means not all sin is the same. Now all sin, all sin will send to you hell. Hello? How, how, many, how many sins does it take to go to hell? One. <laughs> right? Unless you're forgiven by the grace of God. And you're covered by his blood. And he exchanges his righteousness for your sin. But, but not, all, not all sin is the same. Um, some sin brings things with it. There, there, there are certain sins if you get involved with, you, don't, you won't just have to deal with the sin. You will have to deal with what you now gave access to. Now, what I love about this story is, 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 is it, it lets us know that true healing involves the whole person. Jesus, Jesus, heals, Jesus heals him physically, emotionally, and spiritually, which is, a, which is an indication of what the kingdom of God does. It's the rule and the reign of God should impact our whole person. So, so you shouldn't come to God, encounter him, and, and leave healed physically but still be a wreck emotionally God is a holistic being and so when he heals us he heals us holistically now 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 he can't he can't burn what you don't put on the altar right And that's, that's the problem, that's the problem of, of living, a, a living a compartmental life is you only present yourself to God in compartments. And so he can't deal with your whole self because nobody's ever seen the whole you. You always come in pieces. And so, and so this is why the new heaven and the new earth, the, the Bible says we'll, we'll get, we'll get, not only will we get a new earth, we'll get a new heaven. Not only will we get a new earth and a new heaven, we'll get a new body. With a new nature. There will be no sickness. There will be no sin. And, 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 and whatever tears there are, Jesus will wipe away. Now the disciples ask him a question and, when, and we're, almost, we're almost done. We got, about, we got about 15 minutes reserved just for my closing. So here it is. The disciples talk to Jesus privately and, and, and they say to him, hey, hey, why could we not cast it out? But you rebuked it and it came out. Why could we not cast it out? They, they talk to Jesus private, privately to figure out what the problem was. They're, they're asking him, hey, hey, why won't it work? Why won't, why won't, why won't, it, why won't it work? Um, 
Hey, how do you respond after you fail? How, how do you respond to failure? Do you never want to talk about it again? Do you want to bury it? Sweep it under the rug? Man, I don't want, I don't want anyone to see that. See, what I love about the disciples is they embrace their failure. And they look at their failure and they go, no, we can learn from this. So they come to Jesus and say, hey, why didn't it work for us? It worked for you. Teach us. Now here's, here's, here's the part that you won't like because, 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 because before this, before this, he, Jesus, Jesus, heals, Jesus heals the man, right? The boy, and he, he rebukes the demon and he, the boy is healed, healed instantly. Someone say instantly. He, he, right here, this is, this is good. This is, this, is, this, is verse, this is verse 18. This is verse, this is verse 18. Jesus comes, rebukes the demon, the devil goes out. The boy is healed instantly and he has control over his body like never before. And it's this incredible moment. Now this is where we want to live, but the reality is we don't live in verse 18. We live in verse 19. We do. Because the majority of our life is spent asking this question. Hello? Why? Why won't it work? Why won't it work? Why, why won't it work? Why couldn't we cast it out? This, this, this word cast, uh, it, it means, it means to, to drive something out or, or to force it to go away. Now remember in Matthew chapter 10, we talked about this. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 12. And in Matthew chapter 10, he actually gives the disciples the power to cast out demons. He says it. He says, go cast out demons in Matthew chapter 10. And so that's probably what they were expecting to happen. But it didn't work. And so they say, why, uh, what can you see that we can't see? That maybe if you give us insight to, we'll be able to become better followers of you. Right? See, this is a beautiful picture of, of, what, of, what, of what we have to deal with. Because Jesus is absent. And maybe they, maybe they thought, maybe his power only works when he's in close proximity. Or maybe they thought, hey, last time he commanded us to do something, but this time he just left. Right? And so we have to believe that, that the power is still available. It's still available to us. It's, it's for his glory, but it's still available to us. It's not to push my own agenda. Hello? It's not, so, it's not so I can go start an international ministry and, and, and sell my handkerchief. Hello? Tell you, tell you to bounce on one leg, spin around five times and touch your neighbor and then you'll be healed. That's not how his power works. So why can we cast it out, Jesus? And Jesus says, because of your <laughs> little faith. Now, this is what's funny. Because, because back here, Jesus is upset because they're, the generation is faithless. Okay? Now, now they're, they're faithless, meaning they're without faith. The disciples are not without faith. They have faith, but it's little faith. So they have faith, but it's, it's, little, it's little faith. It's, it's, it's ineffective. Why, why is it ineffective? It's ineffective because they're, they're not relying on the right thing. Because faith is dependence on God. See, see, faith requires, effective faith requires the right focus. And so he says, he says little Little, little faith. Now it gets funnier. Why does it get funnier? I'll show you. Because he says, he says, yeah, you couldn't do it because you had little faith. But, 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 if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, what? Little faith? Yeah, you couldn't do it because you had little, you had little faith. But if you had little faith, you would be able to do it. 
huh? So then you gotta ask a question. You gotta, you gotta ask a question. Uh, f- faith must look different. Faith, and, and, and if it looks the same, all faith doesn't, doesn't have the same substance. See, 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 the, Jesus uses the metaphor of a mustard seed. He, you notice he doesn't use, he doesn't use uh, the metaphor of gravel, tiny little rocks. Both are tiny, a seed, a little pebble. Same size, they look the same, but not the same substance. Why? One grows, one doesn't. One remains the same, one has the potential to grow. So look what he says. He says, he says if you have the, uh, faith like the, the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to, to this mountain. Now this is even funnier because this is the mountain they just came down from. Like this is, now I could only imagine what Peter, James, and John's faces look like. like the mountain we were just on? If you, if you say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Notice he doesn't say nothing will be impossible for God. He says nothing will be impossible for you. Now this, this, this text can be manipulated and twisted so that it, it functions in a way where, where it all becomes about your own agenda and not seeking first the kingdom of God. But that's not what Jesus is talking about because faith requires the right the right. The right focus. So, so watch what Jesus is saying when, when he says he says mustard seed, right? In other words, in other words, small faith. So, so what he is saying is faith can be small and still be effective. Because effective faith requires the right focus. It's it's the ability to, to have confidence in what God has called you to do. Can you take God at his word? That's faith. Can you take him at his word? Not can, can you take God at your word? I've taught you this when we talked about, hey, how do you study the Bible? How do we read the Bible effectively? The reality is God is not committed to your word. Now, let me say this. God, God is not even committed to your interpretation of his word because you could interpret his word incorrectly. He's, he's committed to what he said, not what you think he said not what you want him to say, not what you would have rathered him say. He's committed to his word. God, let me say this, God's, God's power requires obedience. God's power requires obedience. The, the only way Peter would know that the power of Jesus' word come when he was walking on water and Peter said, if that's you, Lord, tell me to come. The only, no, the only way Peter would have known that his word has power is if he obeyed. So God's power requires obedience. Does that make sense? Now, what happens to your faith when you, when you meet a mountain? What happens to your faith when you meet a mountain? What happens to it? Do you look around? Man, if only Jesus was here. If only somebody more knowledgeable was here. If only the pastor was here. If only. What happens? What happens to your faith when you meet a mountain? Now, now watch this and see, this is the, this is the beauty of God. The beauty of God. The beauty of God is this. Um, it's, it's almost as if, if Jesus doesn't know how to do comparisons. <laughs> Because, because a mustard seed and a mountain are not the same size. Jesus goes, you see that mountain? Yeah. You can tell it to move and it will. What? Yeah, you, you need faith. Man, that, that must be some big faith. No, you, you need faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. This small. Jesus, that's a big problem. That's, that's a big 
That's a big mountain. I, I would think if, if I need to deal with a, with a mountain-sized problem, I would need mountain-sized faith. And, and isn't that what we teach? Isn't that what we preach? Hey, you just don't believe big enough. You would prosper, you would, you would succeed, you would have good health and God would move in your life. God would open all the doors that he needs to open, close all the wrong doors that he would need to close if you would just believe bigger. Isn't that what we say? And, and Jesus, Jesus goes, no, 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 a mustard, a mustard seed, a mustard seed because because when, when the focus of my faith is on God, God can do more with less. God can do more with less. My faith doesn't need to be the same size as the mountain. It, it doesn't need to be equal faith for it to be effective faith. And sometimes, sometimes big problems require small solutions. Can we take God at his word? Faith of a mustard seed. And that's what measures the effectiveness of faith. It's your focus. Your focus measures the effectiveness of your faith. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for these moments. Thank you for visiting us. Thank you for meeting us. Thank you for displaying your mercy. Lord, we know that you have spoken. And we've gained insight into the text, your scripture, your word. And yet at the same time, we know, Holy Spirit, that, that you have accessed our hearts. You've not only expanded our minds, but expanded our hearts. And so, Father, we ask that whatever problems may be presented before us, Lord, that you would give us the ability to focus on you. That the focus of our faith would be you. It would be your greatness, your bigness, your love to do the impossible. And so help us to believe. Help us to take one small step. toward the direction of faith tonight. Whatever it is your people are believing for, God, help them to move, to not be stagnant, to take you at your word. We thank you, God, for the fruit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are journeying with us. I pray for every single person here and those watching online, those listening. God, that we, we would feel your nearness and we would embrace it and that we would welcome you not just on the mountain, but in the valley. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.